and we should be live. Let's see, there we go. Cool. Okay. That first 10 seconds is always absolutely <laughs> terrifying when you're just like eight people. Oh, it's still eight people. It's still eight people. <laughs> um, but I can see it's gone up and we're at 61 now. So um, it's flying up. Uh, normal British question. How is everyone finding the weather while we wait for everyone to, uh, to join the session? It's all right. Could be better. <laughs> yeah. I find it really it's random at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's lovely yesterday, but it's not. It's looking very muggy out there today. Hopefully, that's I, not kind of. Um... I was in a I was in a meeting the other day, and there was about four of us, and I think most of us live around London. And there was a cloud. There was a thunderstorm. I'm not kidding. It was going around so fast, <laughs> and like someone got like heavy hail and rain in one in one of the houses, and yeah. then like the next person, the call just got like a, a massive. <laughs> storm on the other and it was like you could tell it was going around the location as well and it was just bizarre just everyone kept looking at their windows it was like why is it raining so much yeah it's uh welcome to the uk where you can't really predict what weather you're going to get any <laughs> moment so uh, it's the only other place i can compare it to is florida where you will have hurricanes one second and the next minute you'll have heat so weird weird nation um i think we we've just about to hit 150 so i think that we can make a uh, make a start so um for everyone just uh, that's uh, attending so we've obviously got the the team on from uh from Tainsbury's today so what I'll I'll do is I'll allow them to introduce themselves when they get to their their slides but just so you know who is on the call so we've got Andy we've got Ollie we've got Mike we've got Kindy and we've got Brenda um so it'll be an introduction to Sainsbury's tech um, and at the end, we'll have a panelist Q&A, um, probably expecting that to be 10 to 15 minutes. We've had some questions sent in from people uh, from the audience already, so I'll go through them. Um, but also what we're mindful of is that we had over 700 people sign up for this event. Um, so we knew we weren't going to get everyone, uh, get through everyone's questions. So if you have further questions afterwards, please send them through to hello at hackerjob.co. And we'll get all these answered in a timely manner and then sent back so that everyone can see uh, the questions and the answers. So I think the um, I think this first slide's are yours, Ollie. So I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, my name's Ollie Troward. I'm the engineering manager currently for Argos Pay at Browse. Um, brief history of me. Um, I've worked uh, at Sainsbury's just over five years. So um, I've worked on a variety of projects. Some, some of you may recognize called Sainsbury's Entertainment. So we had a digital sort of e-commerce platform many years ago. I worked on Chop Chop as well, which is a six minute delivery service that started around sort of London as well. And then uh, predominantly most of my time at Sainsbury's, I've worked at Smart Shop as well. So you, you may have heard uh, we, we support kind of the handset scanners and the sort of uh, recently sort of mobile location, mobile pay as well. Um, so the project I'm actually going to talk about today is uh, my most recent one. It's actually the first Argos project I've actually worked on um, at Sainsbury's Tech. Um, so it, it, it's pretty awesome and exciting for me. I've only been on the team roughly around six to seven months. Um, so today's talk really is going to be a brief introduction of what Argos Pay at Browse actually is and um, a bit more of the deep dive into technology as well. So, um, yeah. So very briefly, just want to show you um, our journey with uh, what we've actually seen within the Argos store. So as you probably all know or remember, the company known as the Book of Dreams, the catalogue that's been around, um, I think it's been around for almost 50 years now. Um, so the stores are predominantly, obviously, as you know, still have those today. Um, some of you may be aware that and there was an announcement made that we will stop doing them in the next couple of months, which is really sad. Um, but uh, we're very much in a place now we're kind of ready to digitise and sort of change how the Argos stores um, are running in the future. Um, the next step, when I kind of first step into um, kind of, you know, having, you know, more, if you call it digital, but we have our first sort of stock checker. So I don't remember these as well. I um, absolutely love them as a kid. I think one of the best user experiences personally, because the button's just so big and great to press. Um, so some of these are actually still some in stores, um, but we're in a place to um, replace them at some stage. And then also a, a kind of first like proper digital solution was digital store browsers. So um, the idea that it's very similar to experience to the website where um, you can search for your thing, uh, search for um, anything, check if it's in stock. And then uh, once you pick your goods, you can essentially go to the till and pay from there. So that's a brief history of what we've had in Argos stores. Um, to go on to the next slide, uh, what we're actually, what I'm gonna be talking about today is pay at browse. So um, doesn't look too dissimilar from what you've seen in digital store browsers previously. Um, the only difference is probably the word pay. Um, that's being referenced. So the idea that you can um, ultimately have a, a better sort of self-service journey uh, within stores and, and kind of hopefully skipping the, the man tills that we've had for so many years. Um, 
So just very briefly, what we support, um, if you're curious, you may already know, um, obviously the kind of browsing features similar to the, the browsing um, solutions we've had previously. Um, the key thing is all purchasing. So um, you have a chip and pin device, which I'll go into more detail, a bit more of the tech side of that in a moment. Uh, you've got things like search and recommendations. So um, very similar to the website. Again, you've got recommendations. And when you type things, it can sort of tell you um, roughly, you know, what might be useful or things that can relate to products. Um, once again, similar functionality. So we have kind of centralized service for this that share between the website and mobile platforms as well. So you'll get the same experience wherever you go. Um, we support majority of, of debit and credit cards. Um, we also support contactless. Um, and also we manage sort of reservations as well. So ultimately we want to be in a world of pay or browse where you can pretty much do most of your journey on, on those devices. Um, and then more recently, you may be interested. So uh, we released Argos card support um, early at the beginning of this year. And uh, more importantly, we did Nectar as well. That was only about two months ago as well. So now you have an opportunity where you can earn Nectar points in Argos, uh, which is really exciting for uh, for us. So um, yeah, moving on to the next one. Briefly, the technology, I'll, I'll start with kind of the hardware and then go into the more sort of software aspect in a bit. Um, this is kind of a very uh, basic overview of what we have. Um, we've got kind of the e-tail, which is divided by one of our um, suppliers called AOpen. Um, it's running on Windows 10, um, which is kind of customized and slimmed down for our performance as well, which I'll go into more detail in a bit. Um, the, the kind of the reason, the rationale why we decided some of these bits and pieces as well is um, kind of the opportunity that in the future, um, we, we could think of an idea of what, what we've been calling kind of universal platform, the idea of where actually could this device and this hardware and this solution actually be shared across uh, multiple uh, platforms and brands. So for example, um, you know, you could place that same tablet device uh, within a Sainsbury store, for example, and then offer things, um, offer offers that could be related to, um, you know, other aspects within, uh, within Sainsbury's. Um, also recently we, we supported uh, contactless, so um, uh, we obviously uplifted kind of uh, £45 in the UK. Um, our guys are also based in Product of Ireland, so uh, we also uplifted to €50 Euros as well, um, which was, which was uh, the point across the, across the estate. And then finally we've got a little receipt printer as well. Again, we're trying to move into a world where we can kind of get more e-receipts uh, within Argos and obviously reduce sort of any paper that's necessary. Um, so what's inside, uh, sort of, this, again, very sort of high level, but roughly just wants to show you what's happening within the device from the software aspect. So um, as I mentioned before, it's running on Windows 10, uh, which is a version that's currently in support for the next foreseeable few years. Um, we actually have a backend API, uh, which is written in uh, Kotlin and uh, using Spring Boot. So um, this does a lot more of the kind of operational stuff that's happening within the device, which I'll go into more detail. Um, we, we actually have um, kind of our own flavored version of uh, Chromium as well. So um, ultimately this is for kind of a lot more policy control. This is obviously a shared device that customers keep going in. It's not, not really personalized to one particular person. So we need to make sure it's sort of safe and secure and kind of locked down to, to what we need. And then the front end itself is, is React and uh, Redux as well, which is sort of commonly one of our um, uh, front end uh, frameworks that we use um, across, across Argos and Sainsbury Tech. So what's outside? Um, so very briefly, just wanted to show you a bit more. Again, you've got the kind of physical aspects as well. Uh, on the left, we use this kind of service called ATS um, that kind of uh, securely sends a lot of our communication to the pad and back, ensuring that obviously, you know, we're following PCI compliance and, and, and proper protocol for um, card information. Um, we use a few any of our services as well. So um, we, we've got things like cloud watching Barna for ultimately sort of our logging and monitoring. So telling us um, how each device is behaving. Um, and, and it's healthy. Um, we've got some lambdas as well. It's a variety of things. So uh, the lambdas obviously are sending information across and, and kind of integrated with, with some of our S3 buckets. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about AWS IoT. So um, IoT is probably uh, one of our kind of core features that we're, we're using majority at the moment. So IoT is what we're using to uh, send a lot of deployments out to devices. So, um, you know, Optimus is a bit different to simply by building an app or a website and kind of serving it in one place. You know, we manage a, um, quite a variety of devices as well. So AWS IoT helps us for features like um, basically device reboots or application upgrades um, and a variety of other operations as well that help, that help us um, sort of manage and configure the devices. So um, next, just very briefly, um, just want to talk briefly about how we did Nexus. So um, we had a bit of a, a problem uh, recently with Nectar. So um, what, what you can see here is just a brief overview of the architecture that we used for um, sending Nectar transactions. So um, the, pro the problem we faced into was that um, basically when we, we, we had um, provided a, something called a civil customer view. So this is kind of our view within uh, the company that helps us kind of ensure people get the next points on time. And um, we were provided a Kafka queue that was uh, sent out to sort of obviously um, get the, manage the load and obviously ultimately send those transactions out. 
Uh, one of the problems we faced into was um, we have about 7,000 devices across the UK alone at the moment that were support net cards and roughly around 25,000 transactions are expecting a day. So um, anyone that's probably an expert um, in Kafka will understand that if you have roughly around 7,000 Kafka uh, producers running around the entire um, UK, that it's going to be quite problematic because a variety of reasons, for example, um, certificate management and uh, updates. So um, the, the problem when you have that many devices you manage in the estate, uh, often you can fall into problems where um, devices may not get the latest updates. So it could be that one store did not get update for a variety of reasons, networking issues, the, the device just generally not receiving it or in a state that it could not receive that change at the time. Um, and ultimately yeah, at a loss where customers wouldn't be able to receive the next points. So uh, what we did is we built something in between. Um, this was actually our first uh, microservice that we built uh, within the Pay It Browse team, which we're really happy about. So we're hosting on ECS um, and uh, we had sort of a Dockerized microservice um, that kind of sat in between and also a load balancer as well. So rather than managing 7,000 devices of Kafka producers that we had across the estate, uh, we could manage even particularly one or three, depending on the sort of scale and load that we have that gave us a lot of flexibility. So um, something again, that really helped us other aspects like monitoring alerting again, you know, having a small amount of producers to monitor is much easier than many more that we have currently in the estate. Um, so just very briefly, just before I sort of finish, I want to briefly talk about our sort of scaling challenges. Um, so um, within our kind of um, area, of obviously, you know, we've got a lot of devices to manage and, and ultimately, you know, it can be um, quite difficult to understand what's wrong with them and, and how they're performing. So these are some of the questions that the team are working on and, and moving on to sort of next slide, I want to kind of show you very briefly the, the solution we're looking into. Um, so anyone that may be kind of an expert mobile device management, uh, this is something that Sainsbury Sec have really been uh, looking forward to using. Um, and I think I believe the SmartShop team are already using it, something called Workspace One or for a better name, AirWatch. Um, and some of the features you want to take out of this is AirWatch uh, ultimately is um, a mobile device management tool that would give you a variety of information about the device. So the real granular stuff about well, maybe network information, sort of power, um, you know, a lot, a variety of things, security policies and that sort of stuff as well, making sure the device is safe and secure. So once we get to that sort of place that um, we can kind of integrate that, the really cool thing about that we're really excited about is the RESTful JSON API that we've got. So some features we want to focus on um, about sort of configuration and customized reporting. So what we can do with that information is actually pull it out, kind of script it, program it and kind of schedule it in a place so we can build a really granular report of like, this is everything about our devices and, and tell us uh, more stories than maybe what we're getting at the moment. Um, another thing uh, which is really cool the team are looking to is automated scheduling of, of deployments. Um, so we're currently moving to GitHub Actions for our CI pipeline at the moment. So um, which is which is quite cool is um, Elch support scheduling of uh, application deployments. So the cool thing about that is what we can do is moving more to sort of a continuous deployment model is the idea that on code push using GitHub Action, you could quite easily hook that into the AirWatch API to schedule that release there and then. So ultimately that build could be ported over to AirWatch and that will give us the, the um, you know, kind of automation to send that in, uh, that um, kind of those updates down to those devices. Um, so something really cool we're looking forward to as well and kind of minimize that, that human contact that's needed for doing deployments and ensure we can deploy at pace with the amount of devices we have. Um, and, and finally, uh, policy and alerting management as well. So again, um, we use PagerDuty for our alerting. So at the moment, engineers um, have that sort of hooked up. I think it's plugged into Slack, I believe, and a variety of other things like New Relic as well. Um, but we want to get in the place where, um, again, that kind of visibility of devices, making sure they're healthy, making sure they're performing in the right place. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, that that's kind of the thing that, you know, we want to be at looking in the future. Um, so that's it. That, that's me. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. That was a very brief deep dive into what we're doing at Pay Browse. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. Really good, Ollie. Um, Andy, I think this next slide is yours. Yep, that's me. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm Andy Gervin. I've been at Argos and Sainsbury's Tech now for six, uh, nearly seven years. So in that time, I've been kind of lucky enough to see the transition on the front end go from uh, kind of a business structure that didn't really focus on front end uh, or necessarily even care or, or kind of give quality to the front end to now this large scale team of multi brands, uh, extremely experienced front end engineers. Um, so that's a really interesting journey we've been on. Uh, but we've now got challenges that we kind of only have started to see now at these scales. So, I mean, uh, with every new vertical that we get turning up uh, in, in our kind of organization structure, things turn up and we have to kind of adapt uh, to, to the challenges that we're going there. So I'm going to give a quick look at the journey where we were, 
where we are now, where we are today, and where we're going kind of, uh, uh, and our hopes for the next few years going forward. Okay, so uh, where we used to be, anyone who's kind of worked in front end for long enough will have seen a file like this, and I can kind of complain about it because I'm pretty sure I wrote it. Um, so when I first started, we worked on a kind of legacy tech stack. Uh, it was a monolithic piece of software. It's called IBM WebSphere Commerce, for anyone who knows it. Uh, like I said, there was no focus really on the front end. It's not really uh, a critique. It was more um, uh, about the kind of functionality of, of getting WebSphere Commerce working uh, at that point. And kind of front end engineering was pretty much working in one CSS file, you know, doing uh, importance everywhere to kind of get it looking how you wanted to. There were some nice things like CSS compression and JS minification, but it wasn't really kind of the ideal situation. Uh, next slide. Cool, yeah, so in terms of the pros and cons of that original thing, there's not too many. I mean, you could say it's one of the easier kind of uh, developer experiences you can have. You open a CSS file and you add a new line and off you go. Uh, but obviously there's loads of uh, kind of cons there. So you've got long development cycles. Uh, we used to have six monthly releases, which uh, kind of were prone to defects and bugs because it was very difficult to test uh, the front ends. And obviously this, this solution never really worked uh, uh, at scale, kind of as we added more and more pages, features, functionality and brands. Uh, next page. Cool. So where we are actually today as we talk. So uh, over those six years, we've now spliced, uh, uh, specifically talking about the Argos site at the moment, um, spliced the Argos site up into verticals. So now we've got uh, kind of multiple applications, each with their own repository, stitched together at the domain level. So we use Akamai to say, if you go to slash, you go to this application. If you go slash search, you go to this application. In between that, um, we've got some component libraries. So one being our kind of in-house uh, web components, uh, component library called Bolt, and another one called CMS Components, which is a really boring name for all of our CMS components. Uh, we have got a CSS framework um, that kind of gives us our grids and our typography. And we also start to work quite closely with uh, another component library called Luna, which I think Mike might uh, touch on later. Um, we do have common tooling, so we've got things like React, Node on the Server, Redux where needed, Webpack, all the kind of industry standard stuff and things like uh, housekeeping tech like ESLint and Prithia uh, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, next slide. So yeah, we're in a, we're in a good place at the moment. Um, we can deliver good UI improvements in isolation. It's much easier to spot bugs because we're working on our kind of individual uh, applications. Quick development cycles, you can iterate quickly. Um, common components uh, in our component libraries, they share best practice across all the teams. Um, you get a really good developer experience because you just clone one project and you can kind of work on that. And then yeah, small code bases and a quick kind of CI working on it. But that doesn't mean it's without its faults. So we've got um, some cons in this. One, I've kind of put it third there, but I actually think it's number one, which is the dependency management is a nightmare. You update a component here and you have to update it in multiple different places. Um, you do get bad things like knowledge silos where an engineer might know nothing about the applications around it. Uh, and you also get kind of differing priorities. So one team might focus really heavily on uh, improving performance and another team might uh, focus really heavily on accessibility, but because they're isolated to their one uh, uh, application, you get those kind of benefits only in those uh, verticals. And there is a little bit of forced tech choice there because if you want to stick to this ecosystem of using these things, you have to use React and you have to use uh, this, that and the other. And it's also difficult to see, if you're working on, on these isolated repositories, it's difficult to see the big picture of the whole site. Uh, next slide. So yeah, so where we're kind of heading towards, um, it's a little bit of both actually. So a mono repository, uh, essentially bringing all those application repositories under one parent uh, repository to handle those things like dependency management, publishing, code quality. Um, we still get all the benefits of the front end, uh, of the um, you know independent uh, repositories, but they just live within the single repository that kind of handles the, the, the kind of, the, the grunt work really. Uh, next slide. So this is really good. Then this is kind of where we're hoping to get uh, over the next few uh, months. So with this, by all the applications living in one repository, we get dependency management taken care of because we use things like Learner and Yarn workspaces, which mean if you update it here, it automatically updates across everyone that consumes it. Some really nice uh, kind of soft benefits are like best practices shared. So you have to work uh, in a kind of common, commonly good way uh, on the repository. Teams have visibility of all the code uh, that you might want. 
uh, uh, shared backlog of things. So like I talked about before with the, you know, a focus on accessibility and performance, they now come together and hopefully that is a shared backlog of responsibility that everyone uh, can benefit from. And also little things like, because all the, all the kind of the boilerplate is taken care of for apps that might just want to rapidly prototype or rapidly, rapidly develop, uh, you can kind of just plug and play and off you go, you've got Jest, Cypress, all these things kind of set up just ready to go. Again, it's not perfect. There's no real perfect solution. There are some big problems with the fact that they are, they can get quite big. So if you've got a large business and you've got lots of these verticals, putting them all into one repository can blow that repository up quite big, uh, which means that things, it impacts things like CI, CD times because you kind of run at the roots, you run all the unit tests and end-to-end -end tests at the roots and they can get bigger and bigger. Uh, there is more of a reliance on automated tests because you want to make sure that if you impact something here, it doesn't, because they're all tied together now, it doesn't impact here. You need that kind of reassurance a bit more. Um, another kind of business sensitive one is basically moving someone's files and it can become a little bit of a, of a, um, a misstep if you do it incorrectly. So if you go and go into some team and they're very precious about how their files are organized and you lift and shift it over to your uh, kind of repository, you can kind of potentially rub people up the wrong way. So the comms piece there has to be really good. Uh, next slide. So yeah, kind of just called out some of those challenges, but uh, one of our challenges we've got at the moment is, so I've, I've, we've got a monorepo that has our component libraries in and our tooling and our helpers, but we haven't yet kind of migrated one of our larger UI apps in. So we need to see kind of what happens there and how that all plays out. We want to look and see if we can actually have some independent CI triggers. So being able to not just run only when things happen on master and this thing, you know, and run everything. We want to be able to independently run CI. And also, uh, you know, a little concern at the back of my mind is that kind of, are we going to go end up being too integrated where it becomes uh, a kind of large, essentially uh, monolithic piece of software if done incorrectly. So that's another thing we need to kind of keep check on. So yeah, really just to kind of highlight the tools and techniques we're using for this. So learner and commit lint are essential for this because you get really nice um, kind of yeah, learner, commit lint and yarn workspaces are kind of the, the, the trilogy of tech tools that you need to have uh, dependency management, auto publishing with a kind of really nice commit messaging and those kind of things. Uh, we're using GitHub Actions. So instead of uh, running all your unit tests and end-to-end uh, -end tests on push, they now run as part of the pull request. Things like Bundle Watch, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Pretty uh, shared configs like ESLint to make sure that the, the PRs uh, don't descend into kind of comments about code uh, opinions and things like that. And then auto format on git commit to make sure that everything looks really nice. Uh, so three uh, really quick tips. So one that caught me out is if you're using uh, Learner to uh, Yarn Works system and Learner to build your um, kind of model repository packages, make sure your dependencies are set correctly, because if not, they won't happen in the same build order and you'll get missing files, which is a important one. And next one. Okay, uh, bundle watch. So bundle watch is really good for visually seeing how big and small your uh, assets are getting as you're building them. This is important, especially because if you've got lots of shared dependencies, you don't want to accidentally cause uh, a large file size bump in, in a repository that you don't really know too much about. And then the third one, this is just this is more of a Cypress uh, thing, but if you if you are having lots of end to end tests run, I found it actually really uh, is beneficial to instead of independently running each uh, end to end test. So you can see here on the left, I've got thirty six tests. Uh, this little script at the bottom is just a web uh, like a, a JavaScript file that you bundle all the end to end files into one test. So that means that it doesn't have to re, you know, open and close each session to Cypress every single time it runs a test. And you can see here that's taken down our 36 tests to go from five minutes to about just under three minutes, which is a really nice uh, benefit. Uh, yeah, and so they're the links to the things that I've mentioned that aren't necessarily uh, kind of common. Uh, commit Lint and Bundle Watch, I'd really, really uh, recommend. And that is me. Amazing, Andy. Uh, Prendra, you, you were up next. Yeah, I'm good to go. Yeah, so hi, I'm Brenda. I'm a front-end engineer and I've worked at Sainsbury's for the last 18 months. I'm in the Argos basket and checkout team. So I'll just be talking a bit about our team. So I've added a little photo, oh, if you go back, sorry. Um, so I've added a photo of our last team lunch pre-COVID, which seems like a long time ago. Um, there's about 25 of us in the team and we're quite a diverse bunch of individuals. We're split across into three scrum teams and each team is made up of developers, QA, product, and UX. Our team is responsible for the trolley page and the preceding pages, 
that the user uses to purchase their order. We look after the UI and the services that communicate with the various backends. Next slide. So there are three user journeys for purchasing an order online. So you can reserve online and pay in store, you can pay online and collect in store, and you can pay online and home delivery. We're currently in the process of migrating these um, payment journeys from our monolithic application, WebSphere Commerce, to microservices. We have recently reached a massive milestone and completed the first two journeys. Um, next slide. And the latest journey that we've completed is the second one, which is to pay online and collect in store. This is the old page compared to the new payment page, and the old one is very out of date. Some of the major benefits of this new payment page is that the UI is using some of the component, um, common components at the, from the Bolt library that Andy has talked about. Um, the new payment page is also fully responsive and has been built with a focus of accessibility, so such as disabling animations for users with motion or balance disorders, enhanced keyboard controls for keyboard and screen reader users. Next slide. So I'll talk about the tech stack we use. As I mentioned, we're migrating off WebSphere Commerce. And so for the backend, we're now using Java 8, Kafka, Spring Boot with WebFlux, Spring Cloud. For the unit test, we're using JUnit. And for end-to-end -end test, we're using Cypress. In the front end, we're using React and Redux. For the unit test, we've been using Enzyme and Snapshot, but we're migrating away from that and we're using React testing library now. And for the end-to-end -end tests, we've been using WebDriver and Browser Stack because of needing to support IE 11 and Safari. But as soon as we can drop those, we'll probably um, jump on the Cypress bandwagon. For the deployments, we're using Jenkins to build Docker images and deploy it to AWS Mesos. Um, monitoring and logging, we're using Datadog, New Relic, and Kibana. Next slide. So how do we work together during a pandemic? Prior to COVID, we were able to work one day a week um, at home, but as soon as lockdown happened, we went fully remote and it has taken us some time to adjust to the new ways. We're using Microsoft Teams for all our meetings and we're encouraging to use our cameras when possible. We still use Scrum and we're working in the two week cycles and we're doing all our Scrum ceremonies online. So we're doing stand-ups, regular groomings, retros and plannings. Retro was a really great meeting for the, um, for the team to reflect and it's important for us for everyone to take part and feel like it's an open place to discuss how we work. We're constantly iterating and we're trying to improve. Maintaining collaboration virtually is key. And we're still encouraging everyone to peer regularly, um, peer program together. And we have product managers and user experience designers in the team that attend our ceremonies. It's been a very interesting year and I found it very exciting um, rebuilding these payment pages while adjusting to these adjusting to these new challenges of working. Next slide. Um, but the team still manages to have fun. I love working with such kind and intelligent people. These pictures were taken from our last social event. So we did a Halloween special um, and we did a bunch of games like bingo and escape rooms during it. Um, so even if we can't meet for team lunches, we still find ways to have fun and celebrate our successes. Thank you. I think Kindy's next. Amazing. Um, Mike, I, I believe you're up next. Or is it Kindy? Apologies. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Mike. Uh, I work on the Lunar Design System. I'm based in the Manchester office for Sainsbury's Tech. And yeah, I've been working full time on Lunar and front end stuff for 18 months in Sainsbury's Tech. Um, so hopefully people know what a design system is, but just to outline that, um, a design system for us consists of a toolbox for people designing and building applications within the company. To me, it's three things. It's design, it's code, it's documentation. There isn't one approach for kind of building a design system, but for us, that's the three core elements of it. Next slide, please. So the Lunar Design System itself, it's um, a set of tools to assist with creating UIs across the uh, group. So what we have within the design code and documentation side is that we have a UI kit. Previously, it was built in Sketch and now it's on Figma. We have a flexible component library, that's React components. And then we also have a styling library, which is based out of SAS and CSS. 
and it aims to provide consistent, usable and highly accessible experiences for colleague and customer applications. So the team that we have is based, um, we, bit, we work full time on the Looney design system and we've got an accessibility expert. We have two experienced designers, two, experience, uh, two UX copywriters, two software engineers and a product owner. And we also have um, a scrum master supporting us as well. They're based both in Manchester and London. So right, you can go on to the next one. So I'll briefly speak about previously uh, within Luna. We've, um, we started with the SAS CSS library and React came along. We built the React component library. We've got a sketch UI kit that's being deprecated that's going into Figma. And we also spend a lot of time um, building quality documentation. That's something that we found is really key to the success of kind of getting people up and running and using the um, design system and understanding where we are and where we're up to. So these are the sort of kind of um, applications that you find that w our system has crept up upon. So or originally we built the system and it was the CSS library and then the React library. And then, it, and after a push, we found that within Sainsbury's it was popping up everywhere. And then we thought that was great. And then moving forward, we had the lots of uh, React applications popping up. And again, and, and as mentioned before, the kind of documentation piece, that's been key to kind of getting people up and running without kind of having to push our work on people. And they've also hopefully contribute uh, documentation back in the future. That's something that we're working on at the moment to try and make it a bit more of a community approach within Sainsbury's. So on this page itself, um, if we just have a look, we've got like uh, zebra handsets, which, you know, when you get your shopping um, delivered to your door, you've got them handsets there. We've got um, uh, the applications. We've got the groceries website itself. We've got um, the contractor kind of sign in book as well, which is a tablet install where people sign in and out. That's for colleagues to use. So just on this one page, we've got 18 different examples of just them orange buttons. And obviously that's something that comes from our system. And these various buttons are something that we've got to kind of like upgrade, support, add bug fixes to. So we got everything working and we got everything out there, but we needed to support the system. So we started working full time on it. Next slide, please. So supporting our creation. So we put it out there and then, yeah, ooh, we need to do outreach. We need to support. We need to answer questions. So supporting that, we've got a variety of Node scripts that automate and get things out there as quickly as possible. We've got a, a GitHub bot account that does try and do as much automation as possible for that. We also use Learner um, as what Andy's gone through before. We've got mono repo set up and that's just for our Lunar system. Um, we try and be a, a little bit more uh, away from the products itself so people can contribute back and it's really agnostic towards different products. We use conventional commits and semantic versioning. Uh, there's an asterisk next to that because that is probably the greatest thing that we have within the system. We can push out major versions, minor versions, update change logs and really be um, really succinct with our messaging and with our um, updates. So if we've got a break and change, we're not going to accidentally have someone bring pull that in and bring in a really big break and change without them being able to be see all the documentation that we've created for that. We publish to a private NPM repo, Sonotype Nexus 3. So that means that all our packages are scoped and on that application. So you type in um, a scoped command and then you get the um, actual package. We use Dependabot to try and uh, keep on top of them dependency upgrades. We all know that's a bit of a pain. We've got SAS doc within our SAS. So we try and automate some of the documentation, same with the JS doc. And then we've got React style guidist. That's uh, the alternative to using Storybook. Um, so we've got style guidist and start, like the potential to use Storybook in the future. Next slide, please. So the we've got everything in play there. We've we've done our orange buttons. We've um, we've got everyone kind of using the the design system, and it, it's out there in the wild. And we've got Sketch, but you can't kind of rest on this sort of thing. So moving forward, we had like the challenge of kind of using that best practice that we'd kind of put together onto a multi-brand sort of feel. So um, 
we moved and our mission statement was to provide a, di provide a design system that has guidance, resources, documentation to create high quality, consistent, accessible user experience for customers across all our brands. And that's the key thing from that slide is that we had to now go from having one set of components that were styled in one different way to then moving across to having all these different brands that have different types of expression. Next slide. So we dipped our toe in the water with this one. Um, it wasn't on purpose. It was just due to the success of the initial launch. We had like Sainsbury's Energy launch, Sainsbury's Bank uses part of the Lunar Design System. We also kind of dipped our toe into Nectate. There's a massive difference, as you can tell there, between orange buttons and a purple multicolored kind of system. So um, the first kind of iteration of this thought was down to kind of like, oh, you take the system and then you do the theming on top of that and you kind of mess around with it and then but you quickly find that they go have different thoughts and different processes so that was a successful launch but we've kind of found that when we laid down with the challenge of um you know having more brands and kind of keeping on top of it and having documentation that we needed a different approach going forward next slide please so going back to the orange buttons, which are my favorite, and also there's a couple of links in there and there's um, check boxes, radio buttons, which are kind of basics for building colleague application, uh, internal applications and also external applications. You know, you're gonna find these on every website. People need to fill in forms, they need to click on buttons. So just one example of this. So buttons, we've got three different types of buttons there. We've got two different types of links. We've got different types of checkpoint because we've got all these different variants. So uh, if you just skip to the next slide, please. This is the same for Nectar. So the differences between the two aren't too bad really, um, but you've got border radius, border color, font size, foreground color, background color, background hover color, focus colors, font weights are different. Um, so if we skip to the next one, which is the kind of Argos buttons. So these are all in design. And then again, you've got the same sort of thing. You've got different uh, border radiuses, border colors, font sizes, all these sort of things. So just by able by being able to identify them, it meant that we could take the foundational aspects of our component library and then go, oh, if we just swap these things out, then we should be able to kind of give a decent experience and be able to quickly build applications with different brand identities. Next slide, please. So this is where design tokens comes in. So we've got all these like really encapsulated um, applications and we found that, so that all them values that I've mentioned before, if we could just, you know, put them into a design uh, token structure, it would mean that we'd have the um, low level values to create styles that would be swappable. And we could also make that agnostic to different applications. So if someone's building an Android application or they're doing a self-service tool or they're building who knows something that could be a shopping list on a fridge in the future or something like that, we should be able to kind of send out these really primitive values to them. And um, they would be getting a head start on the design things, you know, them, them things that you initially do when you bring it up something. Um, next slide, please. So as long as like we have this design token structure, we can use a tool called Style Dictionary, which does this transformation between, so we have all these primitive values such as colors and uh, we really think systematically about our design principles as well. So like spacing, height of buttons and common consistent patterns, we store them in a JSON document. And then what we do is output them into multiple different formats. So we have the JSON, we transform it. And then what we do is try and create themes from that. So one example of that is recently that the work that Andy's been doing on the Bolt system, he's been taking in these design tokens, which is a completely different system and consuming them. And then it's being output onto the Argo side of things. Next slide, please. So this is an example of, uh, I would have loved to show the code off, um, but obviously it can be a bit daunting <laughs> to do in the code demo. But um, what we've got here is our uh, one variable that you have to change within the design system to get multiple different outputs. So here I'm just switching it from Sainsbury's to Nectar. And what we have, we have a global system at the top of it. And then what you, 
um, happens is a bit of a cascade be underneath that, not within the CSS, but within the design tokens themselves. And it brings through the right values for the different themes and the SAS side of things. So it means that we can have one button, which has all the accessibility goodness. So it's the correct um, kind of roles and things like that. And it's all built correctly. So that markups correct, consistent across all these different applications across the business. And it also means that we can just easily swap in and out the brands. And that's been kind of quite successful. All our components can consume this and then them common um, design token principles just get swapped out. And that's like, that was the dream really is like to be able to swap in and out on a variable. That means that all the existing applications that we have can now be quickly themed. And that's going to save so much time going forward, but also opens us up to create really interesting applications, especially with the design tokens as an entry point. So it means that we can swap in and out values and be consistent with our branding going forward. So we've had a successful initial launch. We're supporting multiple styling solutions. That's going to be the big thing going forward. We've got a lot of people that want to use um, uh, JS styling solutions. We're currently using uh, SAS CSS, and that's basically because we've got third party systems as well that um, consume the Luna stuff. And that's a great benefit as well. We also need to push forward now. We've got a real kind of push to try and get us using as many uh, applications as possible to use like the good work that uh, both the Lunar and Bolt systems have been doing going forward. But yeah, that's uh, the Lunar design system. Amazing, thank you very much, Mike. Kindy? Cheers. Uh, thank you, Darren. Hi, everyone. I'm Kindy. I'm a senior engineer manager uh, working in Sainsbury's Tech. So I look after uh, two clothing and other projects uh, within Sainsbury's Tech. Next slide, please. OK, so I'm just going to go through uh, my journey so far um, as a manager. Uh, I've been working in Sainsbury's Tech now for 18 months. Um, I started in June 2019. I joined, we wasn't quite Sainsbury's Tech then, we were Sainsbury, well, I was working for Sainsbury's Argos. Um, I um, started work in the um, Argos side, uh, engineering manager in order management, um, which looks at the, looks after the life cycle of your order uh, that you place uh, within Argos, um, but I'll go through that in a bit more detail. And then in September, 2019, we Sainsbury's Tech formed. So it was everybody from Sainsbury's and Argos coming together um, and, but a main strategic focus was looking at reusability so we don't have to build twice um, and also internally um, uh, uh, led by one of our directors we started the senior women in tech network which is looking at um, our women um, and their careers in Sainsbury's and see how we can get them help them progress up their career and um, and anything else that needs to be insightful for them working in tech um, in November 2019, I started also supporting Argos Inventory Management, uh, which is uh, uh, which is the stock um, that we hold in Argos, but it's all over a very complex distributed network. But I also had the opportunity to look after another team. Um, in January 2020, we launched the Engineering Competency Framework. So it's a framework um, and it sets out, depending on what band you are uh, working in Sainsbury's, of what the expectation that is of your band, uh, where your stretch should be. Um, and it really helps to identify when we do um, have one-to-ones and conversations with our engineers to see, you know, what is the gap? Um, how do we fulfill that gap? Where do we get you the opportunities so that you can, um, so you get a full enrichment in, in the band that you work in and then you can stretch yourself as well. Uh, then in March, 2020, I think it was probably um, uh, a tough period. Um, obviously COVID came along, uh, we had to, you know, scramble to start doing remote working straight away. Um, luckily, we were, we are a, uh, um, a employer that allowed working from home anyway. So a lot of things were already in place. It wasn't really that difficult. Um, but however, we had new challenges. We had to support uh, different working hours for people with different situations. So one situation was parents where they had to um, teach their children at home, but they also had to do their work you know we could change the day around but obviously you don't want to burn them out because they're teaching children during the day and then working in the evening so we had to find that right balance and um, we also had to look at new ways of onboarding new starters as well um, we had to introduce like a buddy system uh, and 
with our other colleagues as well, a lot more pair programming, so we could keep the synergy going that we don't have in the office anymore. Um, and the other thing was keeping teams engaged, and we're still working on that as well at the moment. We don't want people to feel that even though we're remote, we're not in the office, that the career isn't progressing, um, they're still not learning. Um, we very, very much are still pushing that, so it still continues. Um, then in June, I got promoted to senior engineer manager for two clothing. So I look after all the teams um, within two. I've got a small discussion around what we do in that a bit later. Um, and in October 2020, I'm part of a steering group, which is about be your best self. Um, it's a pro providing kind of teaching opportunities, um, coaching opportunities to our colleagues in Sainsbury's Tech. But it's all about keeping our teams engaged. That is a program that is uh, focused on that. Next slide, please. Okay, so Argos order management. Um, this is the team, like I said, it looks after the life cycle of the orders and, and, and the email and the SMS notification that you get in your mobile phone that actually comes from the order management team. Um, so the orders are stored in a order management system, which is the third party uh, software, but we do have microservices that um, take the data from uh, let's say, for example, from the checkout, and it transforms it and then pushes it into our order management system. Um, so our microservices are written in Java, and we use Spring Boot, and all our services run on AWS, so it's all and done in the cloud as well. Um, we're also, we've actually done the design uh, and we're actually just in development uh, for sending notifications for any brand in our business at the moment. So at the moment it's only designed for Argos, but uh, we're just uh, revamping it. So any brand in our business can use it. Um, uh, it's, so, so say you bought from Habitat or you bought from Sainsbury's, it's the same team that have done the hard work we, um, that sends that information out. Uh, monitoring in the team is done 24-7 uh, and we do it using Datadog as the tool to support us to keep our applications in check. Next slide, please. Two clothing, slightly different form, uh, different format. Um, the teams that, we have two teams. Uh, we develop the front end shopping experience and then we have back end, which consists of the checkout ex experience and sending messages down to our fulfillment systems to say an order has been placed. Can you please fulfill it? Um, the digital experience again is uh, it's powered by a third party e-commerce platform. Um, the front end development is done via React and JavaScript. Uh, back end is done with Java, um, and it and it all runs on AWS as well. So that's all good. Um, the platform is actually quite monolithic, and we've got a direction in place to now come off that, to move away from it, um, and to be able to re reuse other existing microservices and Sainsbury's tech. Um, Mike was talking about. Um, a lot about the components that they've designed Lunar and Bolt. So we're one of the teams that are going to go ahead and start using them and migrate onto them. So we can just do some theming and move away from our third party um, e-commerce platform because I think we can just do it just as well within our systems that have, we have built within Sainsbury's Tech. And again, very similar monitoring. Again, is supported by Datadog and New Relic. Next slide. Um, so being in management, one of our key jobs is to also make sure we have good initiatives out there for our engineers to keep them engaged. Um, and it's not just all about technical stuff, it's things that are kind of more soft skill based. So like I said before, um, senior women in tech, we look at the talent pipeline for future women leaders of tech. We look at who could be part of our succession plans, who could go up the career ladder. Do they need coaching or mentoring to help them get there? Um, we've actually done Women in Tech inspirational seminars within Sainsbury's Tech. We've actually done three this year. We did our first one was the evening in Holborn before COVID. Um, uh, our next one was in the summer, which was a half day. And we had key speakers from outside. And we just did one a couple of weeks ago, which was a full day. And we had um, women leaders from AWS and Microsoft as well that gave some keynote speeches. So it was really um, very, very inspiring. It was. And we do uh, soft skill tracks in there to sessions to go to and even technical tracks as well. Um, and being a senior woman in tech, we've all provided our personal professional profiles. So it's comfortable for our women or or a male to approach us if they need any help uh, and advice. Um, so we're kind of trying to soften it and break the barrier from that perspective. Um, going back to our engineering competency framework, um, again, I'm part of that steering group. Uh, we continue to evolve the framework based on the engineer framework, uh, sorry, feedback, because some of the framework 
can be a bit ambiguous and where they have made comments, we've tried to make that better. And now we're progressing on to looking at what does the community of practice in engineering actually means? What do our engineers need for that? So we're progressing on to that next. Um, and the last piece that we've just launched now is Be Your Best Self, where, like I said, we're doing seminars, workshops or trainings to look at four key areas, um, looking at behaviour, because we all own and shape up and drive our own development. How can we do that better? Where can we get help and support within the organisation? Or what tools we have that can help our colleagues? Um, technical, um, lots of showcases, lots of seminars showing different tech out there that we do within Sainsbury's Tech. Also leadership. So if somebody wants to have a, to know what leadership is about and we try to give an impression of what good looks like um, and citizenship, you know, how we think, how we act, um, you know, and when we pass that down to our colleagues, to other engineers and how that can affect that and, and how to enable ourselves to be the best best citizen really. Um, so we give good teachings to people around us. That's it, thank you. Amazing. Um, well, hopefully everyone's enjoyed that as much as, uh, as, much <laughs> as I did. Um, so I, what I'll do now is I'll take you through some of the questions that came in before, before the event. Like I say, again, for all the participants, if you've got questions and I'll, I'll re, um, reaffirm the email at the end, but if you send them through to hello at hackjob.co. So I guess the first question, when I was going through that, obviously I work with you guys quite closely from an account management perspective already, so I know the answer to this, but Ollie, could you take us through what Sainsbury's DTD is? Because uh, it came up on a few of the slides. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, definitely in my time, I was kind of around when it kind of started. So the DTD, by the way, stands for Digital Tech and Data. Um, so, I mean, for me, when it kind of started, which I think, you know, for many reasons, it was a good move. I think first off being, you know, having Sainsbury's Arcos together and being aware of being one kind of brand is, is awesome because um, ultimately, you know, it, it, it kind of puts us on the spotlight to sort of, you know, grow and change and become, you know, a, a genuine technology function. Um, but also the DTD specifically as well, you, you've got things like data and, um, and obviously digital tech as well. So it's not not really just about tech. I mean, data is an absolute massive thing, you know, this day and age, obviously, you know, we need a data function uh, specifically to specialize in that as well. And I think definitely I've seen within Sainsbury's tech in the past year now that, you know, we are just getting closer and closer to those, you know, people that really work in data. I've never worked data personally much as much as I know some of the specialists, but working with them as well has been a massive help to some of the areas I've focused on, which has been more digital. So um, again, yeah, I, I think I think it's, it's really good to sort of put together um, and, and ultimately, you know, in terms of how organization has changed and how we've worked more collaboratively and more, more cross-functionally as, 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 um, as a division has been great. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's definitely been a good move from, from my, my brief experience in Sainsbury's years ago, where it was de definitely a different time then. Amazing. Thank you. And, um, I guess, Brenda, I'll throw this one at you. Uh, and actually it'd be good to get everyone's thoughts after this, but I guess my question is, what do you love most about working at Sainsbury's? What is it that makes you get out of bed in the morning and think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to work today and I, I love it. Oh, that's so hard because there's so many things. Um, it's a good thing. I just love the people I work with. I have so much fun every day. There's a lot of challenges with the pieces of work that we get um, and it's very collaborative. So everyone has their say and you can have your feedback um, and it's very constructive as well. So it's a really good place to learn and I've really enjoyed my time at Sainsbury's. Amazing. Kindy, can I throw the, the same question at you, just because you're looking from a different level, given the role? Yeah, um, I'm with Brenda there. Um, it's about the people as well. Um, what I really enjoy about my role is helping, um, helping out our business so we can progress forward, helping out people so they can uh, progress in their career or do, sorry, to do better. Um, it's all about helping everyone out, get a, do, um, you know, making sure everything's unblocked so that people can move forwards. Amazing, amazing. Um, I don't know if you, uh, if the guys have got anything to add there before I move on to the next question. Yeah, I was just going to say one of the things I love working on is just the scale. So if you look at some of the brands we work on, you can instantly kind of work on something and put it out to you know millions of people essentially, and 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 really feel positive feedback and critical feedback and all those kind of things. Uh, it's quite the numbers you work with are really quite exciting. Michael Ollie. 
Yeah, um, I think for me is, is one thing, it's kind of opportunity. So um, as I said at the beginning, I've worked on different projects around Sainsbury's and I never thought when I kind of started years ago that I'd definitely work in like a more in-store space. So, so obviously I worked on SmartShop previously um, as well. So it's really focusing on what's happening in store um, and, and now obviously moving on to Argos. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the, I just have to say within Sainsbury's tech, there's always work to do. I mean, there's so much going on, like, you know, it's 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 crazy. And, um, you know, there's always opportunities if, if, you, if you want to choose, move to something, you know, based on your needs or, or, or you know, if you want to move a different project or, or different team, you know, there, there's always something for you. So um, yeah, that, that, that's what's kept me, kept me here for so long, I think. Yeah, I've got all. Um, what I love is I've really interesting challenges, like stuff that I'd never think I'd work on. So, for example, I come from a front end development kind of background and stuff like that. And now I look after a internal code library for people to use. And it's that idea that I'm challenging myself to, you know, help other developers and designers build the applications. It's not um really straight on the front end it's it's really helping the other developers and designers uh you know achieve their goals so it's really interesting space that i'm in nice uh, and the next question i'll throw yourself can you and again we can pass it around the room but uh this covid is it's, it's changed the way that we all work and I, I know that each of you have given some insight into um uh, well you've given insight during this about how it shaped yours but how do you think it will shape the future of how people work at, at Sainsbury's Tech, Gendy? Um, yeah, so I think um, our leadership have noticed that working from home has been very effective. Um, it's been quite inspiring, actually. A lot of our colleagues have actually been very supportive to other colleagues to help them progress with their with their work as well. So I think we're going towards a, more of a mixed model of going into the office and working from home in the future once um, COVID is out of the way, hopefully. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's uh, it's interesting to see how much it, it shaped. Like I probably a hacker job. I openly say that I was probably the person least for working from home before COVID hit because I just didn't have the setup. So I was like, Look, this doesn't work for me. So I'm not for it. But you, everyone's had to find a way to cope, and I probably would foresee that hacker job will go the same route going forward. Um, and then I, I guess the final question, because I'm mindful that we only have a couple of minutes left, so. Uh, uh, I want to end it on, on positive time. Question to, to you, Andy, I'll throw it at you. What's one of the favourite projects you've worked on while at Sainsbury's? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. And not the one I thought I was going to get. <laughs> uh, I'd say, I'd say the, the, essentially transitioning the business and the, the skills that we've got into each different kind of version of the business uh, that's a bit of a weird way of saying it but kind of working with people who are like, kind of experts in the field and adapting to the challenges that we face so i mean uh, one really good example of a project that i'm quite excited about uh, coming forward is really reflecting on how much javascript we use on the site so we've gone from this uh, monolithic uh, piece of software then we've gone very react heavy all in on react and now we're looking at the kind of performance impact and while it's good really generally really when you get into the detail of it there are things you can do and we, we might you know if i could go back in time and review those things uh what, would we use such a heavy javascript library to enable some things some pages that don't really need javascript so really reviewing so taking the kind of experts in, in react and javascript we've got at the moment and then really trying to figure out how to remove <laughs> uh, javascript as much as possible so there's a couple of examples of like our pages that we might want to do like a light version of or a Node.js version of and just see, put it out there, see if customers enjoy it, see the if the performance benefits pick up. Amazing. Brenda, I'm, I'm going to use you as the, the final entry on this. What, what would be your answer to that same question? Um, oh, so finishing off or doing the whole payment journey redesign. So we've got home delivery coming up as well, which will be very exciting to get it all done. Um, but then it's talking kind of about the theme of all stuff that Mike was talking about is that we're going to need to bring in the checkout experience for Habitat as well. So that will be a, another um, project in the future that we're working towards. Um, and that would be a different brand as well, which would be really exciting to do. Amazing, amazing. Uh, so we've got to the end. Uh, I, I'm going to end it with less than 60 seconds ago, given that I've still got to do sign offs. Firstly, thank you for, for all the panelists for attending. Thank you for all the participants for coming. 
uh, I'll reiterate that if you want to send, um, Daisy, can you take us back to the first slide just with the email address on there, if that's okay? Sorry, I'll take a second. Should have left this on the uh, on the on the last slide. But if you want to send, um, if you want to send in your questions, send them to hello at hackerjob.co. We will then siphon them out to all the um, all the panelists and uh, get them answered. But again, thanks for everyone's time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thank you.